Hi everyone, welcome to After Podium. I am very excited because I have a very, very special guest today and uh, someone who inspired me as a flute player. Some of you who don't know, I was a, a former flute player. I don't play much anymore, but um, it's Robert Dick and I'm honored to have you, sir. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, it's my pleasure and privilege. Thank you. Uh, let's let's go back a, a little back because you studied with some renowned flute players. And I want I want to hear some some interesting stories if you have any, and you could pick who who that is. You you studied with the oh. with. Well, I I I stood my my four main teachers um, back in the days when I thought I was going to be a classical flutist um, were Henry Zlotnick, mm -hmm. who was a student of George Barrere. Uh -huh. um, Henry was um, strictly a classical orchestral kind of guy, and um, he was the piccoloist in the NBC Symphony uh -huh. and um, Toscanini, and um, he had emigrated to the United States from Russia and um, arrived with a six-key flute, and he was one of the people who actually had to change to the barium flute. Yeah. Um, and um, then it was James Pompitsakis who mm -hmm. I studied with for several summers um, as a student at Tanglewood and also when I was working at a resort nearby mm -hmm. as a busboy and a waiter with wow. me. Um, and um, then uh, Julius Baker, who I studied with uh, very intensely for only one year. Mm -hmm. But it was a, it was a huge year in my 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 classical development. Yeah. And lastly, uh, Thomas Knifinger. Yeah. Who I studied with at Yale when I was um, a graduate student. Mm. Now the last this, the year I studied with Baker, I was a freshman in college, mm. and that was the last year I took serious flute lessons on a regular basis from anyone. Yeah. Um, and I had started very young, and I really felt it was time to work on my own. And, you know, four years later, um, after, after my first year in graduate school, and I went to music school, the Yale School of Music, as a composer, not as a flutist. Um, and the second year rolled around, and I thought, you know, it's been a long time since I've played for anybody. And um, I've heard all these great things about Knifinger, so yeah. I signed up as a flute minor. So um, as it is, there's not a single piece of paper anywhere on planet Earth that says Robert Dick can play the flute. And, uh, <laughs> I kind of like it that way. So, <laughs> um, and I think an important thing to th talk about is that you know, we tend to make these identities as, mm -hmm. you know, a, a flutist, an oboist, yeah. um, I don't know, a zitherist. Yeah. Um, and those are far less important than being a musician, yeah. an artist. Um, the, the instrument we play is a means to an end, mm -hmm. and it often... We, often people lose uh, perspective and they think the instrument, playing the instrument is the end in itself, and, it, and it's really not. Um, you know, I, I've often told students, said, you know, if you play a recital somewhere, someone comes up to you afterwards and tells you how touched they were, how beautiful the music was, how they were moved, you know, and they go on for a while and they don't say one word about your flute playing, you really did it. Yeah. You know, yeah. you made the flute disappear and it was direct human communication yeah. which yeah. you achieved. And, um, you know, that's it. And, 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 and if that happens, don't walk away and go, but that doesn't talk about my <laughs> tone. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. your tone did what it was supposed to do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in many ways, I was very inspired by my, my year with Baker. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, you know, I was 17, mm -hmm. and um, I thought 
that I was going to grow up to be, you know, principal flute in the New York Philharmonic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you'd asked me then, hey, Robert, what are you going to do? I'd say, I would have told you I'm <laughs> going to be the first flute in the New York Philharmonic. Uh, and, um, and so the work we did was towards that end. Uh -huh. um, there was nothing about playing by ear. There was only lip service yeah. to like understanding the music harmonically, but Julie never actually discussed that yeah. with me. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, the critical thing is it's not do what I say, it's do what I do. Yeah. And yeah. students, classical students get this message that just practice, you'll be okay. Yeah. You don't really yeah. need that other stuff. Yeah. And, um, and that other stuff, is the most important yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, and um, because, you know, if you don't really understand the story, how can you tell it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, um, and it's very sad to me that in schools of music, there are several distinctly different kinds of musical education offered. Yeah. I mean, conductors cannot be harmonically ignorant. Mm hmm. You just can't. Yeah. I mean, you gotta know that stuff, yeah. um, and and you have to really understand music yeah. structurally. Um, and it's not surprising that how many conductors have been composers, yeah, yeah, and vice versa, because so much of it is 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 overlaps so deeply. Yeah. Um, Church organists yeah. need a real musical education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know the choir can't do this in G major. Well, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, we're yeah, doing yeah, E flat yeah. now. Um, uh, service is ten minutes short. Well, no problem. I'll make up something. Yeah. Um, and and yet the the players of the so-called orchestral instruments are truly cheated out of a, a real musical education. Yeah. Um, the focus is all on performance, um, and you know, in the days when anyone who was good could expect to land some orchestral job, it was still dishonest, but it was functional. Yeah. Well, you know, today, who's going to get a full-time orchestra job? Yeah. You know, I mean. Uh, such a microscopic percentage exactly. of yeah. people graduating that it's essentially meaningless. Yeah. And every year we hear about more of the smaller full-time orchestras imploding yeah. from a, a whole season to a per-service yeah. orchestra. Yeah. Um, or simply, you know, poof, they're gone. Um, and the latest it, example was Santa Barbara, just folded Santa Barbara Chamber Orchestra. Yeah, well... Yeah. There you go, and and that's how many musicians who have now had an income stream snipped yeah. off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know if they were at a per, if they had already collapsed per service before they died, yeah. or they were still full time orchestra and died. But the reality is, yeah. they died. Yeah. And because classical music education was removed from public school curricula in the United States in about the 19, early 70s, yeah. um, that in many ways has been the death knell because the music is no longer relevant yeah. in society. People don't have the background. Um, Spike Jones, mm. who had that incredible comedy show mm -hmm. spoofing classical music, yeah. couldn't have that show today because no one would get the jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, is there something um, is there something that we've done wrong? What have we done wrong as as classical musicians for people to put that aside and not care about it anymore? Okay, well, what we've done wrong, and and you know, I, I look at this on a mega level and a personal level. Yeah, you know, the mega level. I mean, what can you or I do? about the marketing forces of, you know, you know, some multinational conglomerate. I mean, really very little. Mm -hmm. But what we can do personally, and this is where I feel we've gone wrong, when 
classical music was alive and well and was the, the music, mm -hmm. creativity flowed from the stage all the time. Mm -hmm. Pianists would prelude before playing a piece. No concerto soloist worth um, you know, his or her salt was going to play a pre-composed cadenza. They were going to improvise the cadenza. Yeah. Um, it was expected. Baroque musicians, you know, treated the score pretty much the way jazz musicians today treat lead sheets. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so creativity, and and when um, I speak to students about about you know the whole question of you know you want to be an artist you want to be a musician and as part of that you do want to survive yeah. um and you want to hopefully thrive and dare we say even be happy yeah. because that's the part that gets left out of the discussion yeah. right and left mm -hmm. You know, everybody's talking about, well, you can get this job here, you can work that, you can develop your audience that way. Yeah. Well, you know, but what about actually also being happy yeah. as, as you do this? Yeah. Um, and a life in music can be very joyous. Yeah. So, um, and what, you know, really think about what people want to hear. Yeah. And... Try to let preconceptions melt away. Um, we're not in the 1850s. We're yeah. not in the 1920s. We're not in the 1960s. We're now. Yeah. What? And for better and for worse, yeah. it's now. Yeah. Um, well, what do people want to hear? Yeah. And I think it's the same thing people have always wanted to hear, which is your musical truth. Yeah. Whether you're playing a fully composed piece from notes in a score, whether you're improvising the piece in part or in whole. Yeah. yeah. Um, but people want to hear the sense of truth that you're telling the truth yeah that um it's not about you you know i mean nothing turns people off faster than the one note solfege artist you know me 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 um and um and and so what what does that mean in terms of being able to tell your musical truth. Yeah. You know, I mean, how do you find out what that is? Yeah. Um, it's, it's not so simple as, well, if I just really learn the notes, the music will emerge. Yeah. Um, well, because well, I, I, I'm yeah. sorry, I interrupted you, but I really want to know what made you the way you are, because early on in your career, from what I read, you wanted to pursue the orchestral career, and you, uh, you said that earlier, but you also had some orchestral gigs, right? You you yeah. played in orchestras. What made you feel and be the way that you are with so multi, uh, multi-talented and, and you also just went different routes and you tried things and you worked on flute and composition and you also teach? What made you the way you are and what well, led you to being the way you are? Okay, well... The, the, the short and totally true answer is life itself. Hmm. Being alive, hmm. you know, um, and trying to be me mm -hmm. and not be shaped by others. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, when I, my edu I grew up in New York City. Mm -hmm. my, my mother was a classical pianist. Mm -hmm. Um, she taught. She never. She never performed, yeah. and 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 it's really a shame. You know, my mother is, you know, the poster, the poster woman for why liberation, women's liberation should exist <laughs> and continue. You know why this incredibly brilliant musician 
you know, took a total backseat to her husband yeah. in every way because she was the wife. Yeah. She also had been a scientist mm. and a biologist. And she was the chief biologist of the U.S. Army hospitals in mm. of the whole entire East Coast in World War II. Yeah. Gave it all up yeah. um, to have kids and being a mom. Yeah. Um, well, that know, that's a tough that, balance, isn't it? To uh, you that know. was the 1950s story in a nutshell. Yeah. But you know, I mean, I'm so glad that that story is, you know, not continuing today. Yeah. Um, I mean, it still continues too much, but it's still it's it, it it's a broken model and it should be left in yeah. the dust where it yeah. belongs but it's um, also no matter when it is it's just really tough for women because uh, no matter what you know if they do want to have a family they have to sacrifice where as men I, i mean we we also have to sacrifice but we don't have to go through that whole process of actually having a child yeah um although i've got to say i'm, I'm sort of envious of what that must feel like <laughs> <laughs> um But in any case, so, you know, we were a cultured, middle-class Jewish family, right. and it was kind of assumed that, you know, all of us would play instruments because that's what a cultured, middle-class Jewish family does. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we do super well in school, and we would all grow up to be successful doctors or lawyers, yeah, or, you know, yeah. kind of thing like that. Yeah. Um, Well, um, my parents got two of the three things, you know. I mean, we did play instruments. We did do super well in school. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so, I, you know, we went to concerts as a regular thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard all those, the, you know, the famous... Russian home runner hitters at Carnegie Hall, yeah, yeah. Um, Ashkenazi, Gilels, yeah. um, um, oh gosh, um, Richter, Sviatoslav yeah. Richter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was an incredibly memorable concert. I can feel it still. Yeah. Um, and and so that was all in the air. Mm -hmm. And plus, you know, the drive for excellence. Mm -hmm. And and. You know, I love the flute, and um, I, I couldn't have articulated it, but the day I started to play the flute, when I was eight years old, I knew I had found it. Yeah. You know, and I gave my first concert that day. When my father came home from work, I put up put two chairs together, sat my parents down, and huffed and puffed. <laughs> hey, Rubank! <laughs> I was really excited. And... Um, And so, you know, this idea that what you do as a flutist is play an orchestra this was what was presented to me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, there at the time, there was only one real soloist. Mm -hmm. It was Ron Paul. Yeah. And, um, and so I, you know, I'm, I followed that because I thought that was the thing to follow. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was... 19, mm -hmm. I played at the um, Berkshire Music Center Orchestra at Tanglewood. They let me in two years early. I played first flute in America's best student orchestra. And at the end of the summer, I knew that I was not going to be an orchestra flutist. Wow. Um, things were waking up. And most importantly, I had the feeling, you know, I'm 19 so much in my life is just beginning hmm. music the most important thing and that was very clear to me that music was the most important thing is moving into this holding pattern mm -hmm. i'm playing pieces for the second sometimes the third time yeah. an afternoon at the tanglewood library looking at the boston symphony's programs for the previous 40 years confirmed that that was the story You know, there was the occasional speckling of different things, but, yeah. you know, it was going to be the big hits. Yeah. Well, I, I, I do, I mean, the, the thing that comes to mind, and sorry to interrupt you again, but 
does orchestra orchestral music have a future in today's world and we talked briefly about how orchestras are folding left and right organizations not doing well is there a future and i know you're not in the scene but is there a future is just looking looking at what's happening i don't know i i, I actually don't know i think it's hard to imagine no new york philharmonic mm -hmm. no philadelphia orchestra you know I, it's very hard to imagine yeah. that things will get to the point where they give up yeah but in terms of orchestral music being a part of sort of normal american life i think that's already passed yeah um and who would have and, thought that 30 40 years ago yeah but again the the things got cut off at the roots yeah you know I mean, if, if there was a musical education going on in elementary school, um, I think the situation wouldn't have changed. Yeah. But um, music got, and art of all kinds got smeared with the elitist brush yeah. because that was a very easy thing for conservatives to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the end of the Cold War was the worst thing that happened to culture in America. Um, because you know the Russians said, "Look, you know what? You win. Keep the ball. We're going home." Yeah. Um, and all those right-wing nuttos could not live without an enemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the National Endowment for the Arts presented itself as the easiest victim there was. You know, um, a couple of paintings did just did it all in, and and. Um, you know, Andre Serrano, um, a deeply religious Catholic, and his painting, or his, his photograph actually, Piss Christ, was not pissing on Christ. Mm -hmm. It was an analogy for how he felt Christ was treated in American culture. Yeah. But could the people see that? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, it was just Christ in piss. Yeah. And we paid for that with taxpayer money. Yeah. Um, and so... Um, I mean, I've had discussions with congressmen and um, local officials, and and they're all talking about it's it's elitist. And I said, you know, there's a proven track record that kids who play in bands together do better in school, go further in college, and achieve more in life. Yeah. You know, learning how to work together and how to listen to each yeah, other yeah. is really important. Now, man, I'm telling you, in some of those discussions, I, I feel I'm going to bite my tongue off because, you know, I'm talking about listening to each other. And I know this guy is not listening to me at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, listening is not his thing. You know, <laughs> so... Um, and... I served on the New York State Council on the Arts Music Panel for a couple of years um, in, the, in the late 80s. And um, we had a program offering orchestras in the state funding if they would program contemporary music. Oh. I mean, it's like, and, and, and it was substantial funding. It was something like a quarter of a million dollars. Wow. You know, you know, I don't know if you're the Binghamton Symphony, you know, a quarter of a million dollars being offered to you yeah. is, is, should be a godsend. Yeah. And what to do for that was a modicum of contemporary music programming and school outreaches. Yeah. So there was going to be a fair chunk of that left over to go into the general operating budget. Um, which was, you know, that was the bait. Mm. Yeah, that was the candy. Well, you don't I, have to spend all of this on new music. Well, not a single orchestra accepted the money. All of whom said, we're, we're afraid of alienating our elderly subscribers. And um, in the 80s, I did have an orchestral position in New York. I was principal flute in the Brooklyn Philharmonic. Right, yeah. um, Lucas Foss, I met Lucas Foss 
playing when I was playing contemporary music in Buffalo, and Lucas offered me the chair. I didn't audition for it. I'm sure that if I had gone through a standard audition process, they would have picked someone else. Oh, um, come on. Um, well, you know, my playing is based on musical expression, not no, not not clinical perfection. Yeah. And um, so, but I used to sit there and look out at the audience. And we had two different audiences. We had a Meet the Moderns audience, which was smaller but kind of vibrant. And then we had the subscription series audience, which was old. <laughs> look at them they were bald or blue <laughs> you know and I would turn to the second flute player and say Gee, what's going to happen you know I mean look at the, these folks are going deaf as we're sitting here um, and 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 who you know demographically look at this who's yeah. going to replace them yeah. we're not seeing young faces yeah. now at European orchestral concerts you will see young faces and you will see a multi-generational audience they're having their problems too but you know it's not called European music for nothing yeah and um, but still here it became an artifact of like my parents generation and a little bit beyond yeah. and and the efforts to keep bringing new people in were not made yeah. So they were afraid of losing the little bit they had, but the little bit they had, you know, the fuse was already lit. Yeah. You know, in 15 or 20 years, boom, we're gone. Well, it's 15 or 20 years later, and now the pop pop of implosion is here. Yeah. So, you know, as a conductor, when you're saying, well, I'm working with youth orchestras, yeah. I'm thinking, well, right on. But um, it would be very important to make the experience of playing in the orchestra more than just following yeah. you. Yeah. Finding ways so that the musicians can actively contribute to the music. Yeah. yeah. And exactly how you do that, I don't know, but you've got you got the resources, the time, the kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, well, to, to, work, to work on that. Um, and I know some chamber pieces, for example, um, where there is a fair amount of guided improvisation mm. in, in the orchestral parts. Yeah. Uh, well, in the, in the, um, I don't know that much full orchestra. In fact, any full orchestra music. Yeah, there aren't much, but... An interesting experience. We held a festival here uh, on Bainbridge Island, and I invited someone who plays, uh, who's a violinist, and played in youth orchestras, and is now a professional and plays with a lot of various bands and a lot of contemporary music. And he came, and I had the idea of having the kids play a couple of chords while we have uh, a few kids who actually are interested in improvising come up and improvise. And it was absolutely surprising. We played a few chords. And I had very young members who came up and improvised, and it was absolutely stunning because I was not expecting them to feel so free and actually play whatever they were feeling in the moment and just improvising. It was really surprising. And I'm talking about kids who are 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. Some of them are very young, but they were very open to improvising. I did the same thing at a college level orchestra and I won't name the college but I did the same thing on a college level and kids were very afraid they were just like am I playing the right note what's going on here I'm, well, I'm not the, sure the time between they were 10 and the time they got to college was negative yeah and so it's nurturing their artistry now no this is something I've said very many times because it's true my training as a classical flutist didn't hold me back more than 15 years mm. in my development as, as, as a musician. Mm. You know, it was so one-sided and so incomplete. And, and the fact that at 17 years old, you know, I was considered a virtuoso flute player, well, great. Mm. But I was just on the surface of the music. Yeah. And, um, 
Sure. I mean, I was a talented kid, and I had feelings, and I played musically and um, more musically than lots of others. But still, um, you know, if the question was, well, Robert, who are you as a musician? I was like, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, can we, you I can't. That? I actually, I actually have a, a different thing, and I really want to get to it. I can't talk to Robert Dick and not ask him about extended techniques. You are one of the masters for this, and you wrote books. and And is there anything new that you're coming out with these days? Something, something new that you want to share, or just how you came to um, uh, come up with these techniques and extended well, techniques? Well, well, first of all. The very question itself is backwards. It's not about technique. I mean, what's a, you know, tech, any technique, you know, the most traditional technique in the world, a vocal is going, oh, right? Yeah. In and of itself means absolutely nothing. Huh. You know, a technique is a tool. It's not a work of art. It's a tool. Yeah. And tools can be used to create things of beauty. Tools can be used to destroy things yeah, of beauty. Yeah, yeah. Tools can be dropped and break your toe. Yeah. But they are just tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've done all three of those things. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now um, I create sound in response to musical need. Huh. You know, when I feel something, something must be said, and nothing pre-existing huh. says it, well then, I have to create the way to express that. Yeah. And so, you know, my music is driven by create, uh, creativity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a phase very early on um, in my early 20s where I was excitedly exploring the flute, trying to find out all the things it could do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I had freed myself from the preconceptions that the flute only plays one note at a time, yeah. that the flute only has a limited you know, timbral range, yeah. that the notes the flute could play were the notes in the chromatic scale. Yeah. Um, So, you know, I'd unburdened myself from those preconceptions. Yeah. Now, you know, it's not that I wanted to throw the past away. I was interested in growing it. Yeah. You know, um, anybody who thinks that one should throw away Bach, um, you know, just needs to have a serious talk with themselves yeah. in the mirror. Yeah. Um, and... Um, You'd be surprised what that person in the mirror might have to say. <laughs> <laughs> so now, you know, as so yeah, that's what resulted in the other flute because I also wanted to share mm. these discoveries with the world. Yeah. But you know, there are times where I sort of wish I'd never written the other flute because <clears throat> people identify me with that. And you know, there's 40 years of music since then, yeah. and that's what's important. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm glad I provided this very helpful tool yeah. to the composers and flutists of the world. And I'm always pleased when somebody uses it. Yeah. Um, but the other flute is not Robert Dick. It's not the autobiography of Robert yeah. Dick. It's a project that yeah. Robert Dick did yeah. in his early 20s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I find myself, you know, well into my 60s now. Yeah. So. <clears throat> The life I've lived is the important part, yeah. and um, so I, I would uh, recommend to you um, the recent recordings I've done. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a CD of contrabass flute improvisations mm -hmm. on John Zorn's label, Sonic. Yeah. Yeah, It's called Our Cells Know, yeah. and in there is you know a, a piece based on African drumming. Mm. You know, I've developed this whole key percussion language. Been working on it for years, mm -hmm. and um, I'm embarking on, or have embarked, on developing um, a repertoire in which I will be acting and speaking and singing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
that's not ready for the curtains to be pulled yeah, aside yeah, yet, yeah, but yeah. it's coming. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of that in, in, in improvised concerts. Yeah. Um, and, and much of the music I play, in fact, many of the concerts that mean the most to me are completely improvised, mm. either solo or with um, other, other musicians. Yeah. And um, ironically, these are the ones that, you know, pay the least, if yeah. at all. Yeah. You know, but, um, and I'm glad that at this point in my life, I don't have to worry about that. I'm showing up for the music. Yeah. Whether I take home $50 or $25, <laughs> just doesn't matter. Because that, that's, because I know that's what it's going to be. And I don't care. Yeah. Well, because I, because, because music is life and I've got to live. Yeah. Uh, and, and I have other, other income sources. Yeah. Um, Uncle Sandu Hedjoin is doing. I was just going to well. ask about that. Uh, why don't yeah. you? Why don't you tell us about that? The the new head well, joint. Um, well, this is my my I think my most significant invention in terms of changing the flute mm -hmm. itself. You know, um, the basic Barham flute that we all play, you know, is Barham's, you know, what was it, eighteen forty seven design. Um, with a few tweaks, you know, the thumb key is different, yeah. it's got closed G sharp, but fundamentally, that's it. You know, I have a Louis Lock flute from 1859, hmm. and um, the differences mechanically between it and the flute made yesterday are insignificant. Yeah. So, um, uh, it, from a musical point of view, I'm sure the te technology is changed but the end game which is the flute as a musical instrument hasn't changed that much yeah. and yet music has changed yeah. and the flute really does need to change yeah. and so um, I got this flash yeah. about a head joint where the lip plate could slide around uh -huh. that was the first idea you know well just try to engineer that um, so it became a head joint in which the entire head joint moves. Oh, wow. So in your podcast, is this going to be sound only, or do we have the picture? No, we have sound only. Oh, okay, because then it's hard. Uh, I can't show it. Yeah. Uh, but basically, it's a telescoping head joint. It's a head joint inside a carrier tube. Yeah. Well, I'll make sure, I'll make sure I include links, because there's uh, there's stuff on your website, so I'll, yeah. I'll make yeah, sure I include that. There's, there's a... Uh, a Glissando head joint demo yeah. right on, 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 on the website. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's transformative yeah. in, of the flute because the instrument can be so much more vocal now yeah. than it was before. And you can play in styles that were very hard to, um, you know, engage in. Um, and, you know, here we are in the 21st century. And my view is that. If you are a flutist, well, you're a member of a worldwide flute family. It's not just, I'm a European, Western classical flutist. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I mean, and once upon a time, it was very hard to know what was going on in the rest of the world, but it's, you know, it's no further away than YouTube now. Yeah, yeah. You know, click and you're in Mali. Yeah. You know, click, you're in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. Click, you're in Argentina, yeah. you know, click, you're in, um, you know, the, the, the far northern reaches of, of, of Finland in yeah, Norway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, and not to be influenced seems crazy to me. Yeah. You know, I mean, if your special love is the sound of the flute, well, why wouldn't you want to listen to more flute playing? Yeah. yeah. And many of those traditions are much more melodically interesting than Western classical music, <laughs> you know, which features only a very tiny number of masterpieces yeah. and, and a lot of mediocrity. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, uh, why, why does it take classical musicians, especially in the recent years, so long to come up with these inventions? You know, we talked about orchestras and how they're so resistant to change and new music. We talk about flute players. Why has it taken so long for the flute to change? 
and why wasn't there someone else before you maybe that could have made some changes for the flute? Why does it take so long? Well, in one sense, you know, traditions do have their built-in inertia. Yeah. Um, and, and we're taught to honor the tradition. Yeah. And, and, and to a certain sense, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. Because if a tradition loses its core values, it's just floating around adrift. Yeah. Um, but the tradition that is not open to new influences is dying. Yeah. Now, there have been people before me. I, I, I you know, I didn't pop out of the oyster. Of course. Uh, <laughs> um, Alexander Murray did very important work in changing the flute. I mean, his work has not been widely accepted, but it was really important and very, very stimulating to my mind. Hmm. You know, the whole Cooper scale thing, all that work done on the flute in the 70s and 80s, I mean, it was really updating an instrument that hadn't been touched in a, over a century. Yeah. Um, then, because creativity is ignored, you know, I, I, I don't think there are that many teachers who would say to a student, you know, like, you know, those old school Russian piano teachers would, you know, you must play only the, the music on the page. This is what you do. You may not improvise. No, you are, you know, um, but it's not mentioned. Yeah. You know, my famous flute teachers, one and all. Never once, not even one time, mention my creativity to me. Yeah. I assumed I didn't have any. Yeah. And my creativity was woken up through the influence of others, not flutists. Yeah. It was woken up through the influence of composers I met. It was woken up through the influence of jazz musicians and improvising musicians and the idea that you know playing in a new music group in college suddenly you were asked to well make it up from here to there yeah 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 you know or here's you know here's a graphic thing you know yeah. um and it wasn't um flute teachers saying you know well, why don't you just you know make a five minute piece of your own up yeah. what would that sound like yeah and, and no, and um, I do include that in my teaching, mm. and some students really are thrilled by it. Some are petrified, <laughs> you know. Um, but something that is almost never said, and should be said, a day one lesson one to eight year olds or or five year olds or two year olds. Um, and reiterated on a regular basis ever since is, you know, if you are musical, you are creative. Mm -hmm. Part of what's inside you that makes you love music is your creativity. And why do you have it? Well, it comes in the package when you're born. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know However you feel about that, whether you feel that that's divine will or just evolution or whatever, it comes in the package. Yeah. And all too often, musical education works very hard to suppress it yeah. instead of embrace it. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's not uniquely true to classic, Western classical music. You know, I've met Indian musicians who believe that, you know, Indian music is music, the rest is noise. Yeah, yeah. Um, jazzers who are in jazz jail, you know, it's got to be played like this because Charlie Parker played it like that or whatever. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of there's a lot of clanking of leg irons going yeah. on in jazz jail. Yeah. Um, and the irony, of course, is that anyone can um, release themselves. You don't even need to ask for parole. Yeah. yeah. You can just open the door and leave. Yeah. But 
they don't. Yeah. They stay right in their cells. Um, and, um, and yet, you know, today in our society, the way it is, there's nothing but new music. All music is new. Mm -hmm. You know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is new all yeah. over again. Yeah. You know, and if you present music as if you were the curator of this noble tradition, you know, people feel like they've been invited to a reception at a funeral home. And, and, and nobody really wants any canapes when they're there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and and so you know there have been really interesting developments in performance style mm -hmm. you do see more and more musicians incorporating music of our time whether it's rock or pop or whatever mm -hmm. into their into their programs some people are in a desperate search for accessibility yeah um which in the end I don't think it's going to go anywhere yeah. um, because it's not really coming from you. Yeah. You know, really feel it in your heart. Yeah. Yeah. It's never going to really communicate. Um, and others, you know, are, are finding unique ways. There's this, you know, fourth wall ensemble, which, you know, speaks and acts and jumps around and does athletic things and plays and, is, is making their way through the world. Yeah. Um, and, and a number of people are opening up, you know, the whole sense of what a, quote, concert experience can be. Yeah. You know, why we see increasing amounts of multimedia things, um, interactive stuff. I mean, just today I got an email about a concert um, where a saxophone quartet, mm. where, you know, I think there are four pieces on this upcoming program. Each one is using interactive video. Mm. And so, you know, change is in the air and change is coming. And um, and I think the important thing that younger, lots of younger musicians who are thinking like, going like, well, let's see, what I was trained for has boiled down to a day job. Yeah. So how can I actually revive this as the center of my life? Because I'm not going to be happy yeah. doing a day job and just playing at night when I'm tired. Yeah. Um, so is that the doors are everywhere. Yeah. They just don't have any signs on them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I look at every musical situation and I said, well, where's the flute star? Whether it's the kind of music that, you know, touches me or not. Yeah. You know, and music is huge. I mean, uh, I, I, I don't pretend that I'm in love with every single bit of it. Yeah. You know, traditional bebop, when played by Charlie Parker, I find incredibly gripping. When played the same way today, I'm, you know, it's like, check, please. <laughs> Well, but, you know, there's, there's there's enormous numbers of people out there involved in praise music. Yeah. Well, where's the praise music flute stars? Yeah. Where are they? You know, there are people playing um, country music. Mm -hmm. Where's the country music flute star? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I, you know, the, I, I've invented the glissando head joint for you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, where's, yeah. where's weeping flute? So, <laughs> uh, uh, well, I wanted to know, uh, and we talked about different things, and some of them might be your inspiration. What, but what inspires you to wake up and do everything that you do every day? Um, it doesn't have it, to be musical; it could be anything. Well, it's it's a lot of things. It's um, it's appreciating the very gift of waking up in the morning mm. you know we're alive I yeah. mean that's you know if, if you just step back and contemplate that for a second I mean how amazing is that <laughs> <laughs> and there's the reality that a time will come when we're not going to be alive yeah. now what happens next 
you know, I don't know any more than anyone else, yeah. but, you know, there's a distinct possibility that what happens next is absolutely nothing. Yeah. So, you know, now yeah. we're live now, yeah. and I really don't want to waste this precious day. Yeah. You know, I want to do things that matter. Yeah. I mean, I sitting talking to you yeah. matters. I yeah. mean, this is this is this is great. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we are communicating with. Yeah your pod people, yeah, whatever yeah, they yeah, are, yeah. and hello to every one of you. Um, and um, and then, you know, hopefully doing something that means something. Yeah. Um, you know, being a good father means an enormous amount to me. Yeah. Um, and I, I have two young children. Yeah. Uh, I became a father quite late in life, yeah. um, as, father, as fatherhood goes. Yeah. I'm always so daddy. All the kids say you look like my grandfather. Yeah. And well, I am old enough to be parents of their kids' parents. But you know, and say, well, aren't you lucky to have a father with so much experience? <laughs> you know, dad, you look old. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, I hope one day they'll appreciate it, yeah. but in the meantime, it's no sale. Yeah. And um, then you just have to, you know, take that with you know humility and enjoy the humor of it. Yeah. So I still feel that my best music, my most meaningful music, is in front of me. Yeah. And um, I'm not prolific. Um, I take much more time to create a piece than many others do, mm. um, but so be it. Um, you know, I wear many hats, and all of which need time and attention. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I wish I had somebody to take care of all the business of Robert Dick, but I don't. I have help in some departments, yeah. but not others. Um, and, 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 you know, that's also the zeitgeist today. Yeah. You know, a career in music is a great big do-it-yourself kit. Yeah, yeah. And you got to be ready to approach it from an entrepreneurial point of view. You know, when I was a kid, the, the, the phrase like, the business of music. Yeah. Uh, the business of music. Huh. I'm an artist. Yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. Business. yeah. Well, I got over that a long time ago. And, you know, we all are involved in, you know, the everyday realities yeah. of, you know, you love that concert, well, go get it. Yeah. So that you can go play it. Well, you know? three, uh, I, when I said I'm going to talk to Robert Dick, I got three questions um, from possibly some of your fans or people that you might know or might not know. But uh, first question is by Ron Mead, and he said, how long do you practice each day? Oh, um, that varies. Now, I've been playing the flute. It, 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 well, it's frightening how long I've been playing the flute. Um, in November of 2018, it will be 60. That's wow. six zero years. Wow. At this point... I know that if I don't play today, I can pick it up tomorrow, and I'll know which 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 end to blow in. Yeah. Um, um, so sometimes I practice very intensely. Sometimes I'm focused on other other things. Mm -hmm. um, so I I have moved singing to be more and more important in my musical everyday life. Mm -hmm. And the two things that I do try to do every day <clears throat> are something creative and sing. Yeah. And often that's that's what I do. I sing creatively. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's awesome. You know, it's it's a juggling act because yeah. um, I play all the flutes mm -hmm. and and making sure they all get time. Yeah. Um, is, is 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 challenging. Yeah. Um, and it, it often, the, the, the instrument that I'm developing some music on now is the one that's going to get the most airtime. Yeah. 
Next, so, next. Oh, next, go ahead. Next, go ahead. Sorry. Next question. next question. Dylan Arthur Baker says, "Best piece of advice for young freelance composers." Young freelance composers. Hmm. Listen to interesting. Listen to as many young groups and soloists as you can go to concerts yeah. and go to concerts you wouldn't normally go to yeah. like a, a french horn recital yeah, yeah yeah okay now you will clearly see how much you are needed yeah. because when you hear the junk that gets played well this music needs to be replaced and yeah. who can do that you yeah Now, when you hear somebody or some group that for whatever reason at all seems kind of exciting to you, mm -hmm. make a point of introducing yourself and saying, you know, I'm a composer and um, would you be interested in you know, working together to create a piece of music? Yeah. Yeah. It's a rare time they will say no. Yeah. It's like, oh, someone loves us, yes! Yeah. <laughs> Someone wants to write for us? Wow. I mean, I can hear the French horn thinking, player thinking, you mean I might never have to play Lennox Berkeley again? <laughs> and um, so, um, <laughs> as a young composer, writing smaller pieces that get played in recitals is a really good thing to build your reputation. Yeah. Um, you know, about 25 years ago, John Anthony Lennon wrote a really good piece for classical saxophone and what well, was tape at the time. Now it's pre-recorded sound. It was called Distances Within Me. And for the next decade, it was impossible to hear a classical sax recital without hearing that piece because it was head and shoulders above everything else in the genre. Um, well, that had to have done good things for John Anthony Lennon, um, And he got played. Uh, and so, you know, none of us are going to start out, or almost none, with major orchestral commissions. The yeah. Metropolitan Opera is not calling 20 year olds. Yeah. So, you know, but start getting pieces played, uh, forming your own group. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, never forget that. Um, Phil Glass drove a taxi in New York for years so that he could pay the players in the Phil Glass yeah, ensemble yeah, yeah. in their early days. Yeah. And um, it worked out, didn't it? Uh, one more question. Aaron Larger Kaplan, who I had on my podcast, he's a professional guitarist. He said, awesome. Uh, I saw him a few years ago, inspiring. And the question is, how does he, his experiments in writing for flute affect his non-flute writing? Oh, well, my non-flute writing, I, I approach the same way as the flute, understanding that I know less. Mm. Um, you know, um, um, I couldn't possibly write for guitar the way Donald Crockett writes mm. for guitar. For example, and if you're a guitarist and you don't know Donald Crockett's music, you should. It's fantastic. Mm. Uh, but Don is is a guitarist, yeah. um, and but I was extremely influenced by electronic music. Mm. Um, you know, hanging out at the electronic music studio at Yale was a very fertile time for me, mm. and the ideas of continuous transformation of sound. Um, You know, there's a moment in Stockhausen's Kantakta mm -hmm. where a woodblock is turned into the sound of a gong in continuous steps. Mm -hmm. That blew my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, now that that's an incredible idea, yeah. and and it was very formative. So my my best non-flute writing is percussion, mm -hmm. um, because again, I there's so much I could actually learn yeah. by doing myself. Um, and but I, I and I always when I'm writing for other instruments I work with the players yeah 
you know, you just if you're writing a trombone piece, uh, you've got to spend time with the trombonist. Yeah, of course. You know, you can get all the correct slides from the Alfred Bladder book, but there's more to it than that. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. Is there anything that we missed that you wanted to mention? Oh God, we could go on and of on. Of course, of course. There's still more. I I really wanted to talk about circular breathing, but this uh this has gone this this is probably going to be the longest one i've done but uh yeah, well, we'll we'll do another time as well exactly we can reconvene for another time yeah you know and we can do one on you know the musical implications of extended techniques yeah of course and 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 um uh, of course we could uh, i've the format so far has been just audio podcast but I'm I'm open to doing a video one with you if you want to demonstrate things at some point. That would be great. Yeah. So, but one last thing about circular breathing: check out on New World Records uh -huh. a, a new CD that I made. It's a piece by William Hellerman huh. called Three Weeks in Cincinnati in December." It's one piece, takes up the entire CD. Wow! And um, it's not there because of circular breathing, but. It does involve over 45 minutes of non-stop circular breathing wow. in a beautiful, gorgeous, multiphonic, ethereal world. Wow. Um, there's no other music like it, which is why I revived the piece that wow. was written for me back in the late 70s. Wow. So, and thank you, and um, I hope we actually get to, to work together sometime. I hope so, too, and I hope to meet you, because I, I, I was talking to my brother. My brother listens to all my podcasts. And even though he's not, uh, he's not a musician, but I was telling him how big of a fan I am. And this is the first time I've done over 40 that I'm actually talking to someone who was a, as a kid I was inspired by. So I've, I've, I'm honored to have you. I'm, I'm still young at heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. And I, I look forward to meeting you in person someday. Me too. Okay, and bye-bye, everybody.